Good morning. This is Cal with The Simple Life, and I'm up here with, at Herman's with my buddy, and uh, we're gonna go for a little walk. You know, the funny part about livestock guardian dogs, is they really kind of have their own agenda, and they kind of do their own thing. So if you're looking for a pet, a livestock guardian dog is a horrible pick, because they kind of just, you know, they, they, they make up their own mind on what they want to do. I mean, he's standing back there like, I'm not going for a walk with you. It's 80 degrees out. And I'm like, well, let's go for a nice uh, scenic walk through the woods. He wants nothing to do with it. Very typical of a livestock guardian dog. I think the funniest part about livestock, or one of the funniest things with livestock guardian dogs is watching them at dog shows. You want to see somebody with a lot of patience get frustrated, watch a livestock guardian dog at a, at a dog show. You'll see that owner go around the circle like one time. I don't know, they're supposed to go around four or five times, who knows how many times, I don't really pay attention to it. But that dog will go around one time and once it's decided it's gone around enough times, it stops and it lays down. And that, that owner pops out, I don't know, a half dozen treats and it's trying to shove treats in that dog's face as fast as possible and that dog's going, well, uh, thanks for the treats, but uh, you can go fly a kite. I ain't walking anymore. That's a livestock guardian dog for you. They, uh, their instincts are just kind of there. They are what they are. I find trying to force livestock guardian dogs to do what you want them to do is a good way to get frustrated and potentially damage a dog so um, and i know i say it probably every single video but it is just it's nice i mean you get out in that sun it's like 80 degrees back here it's like 70 something it's so nice okay so i wanted to show you a couple things in here so right here so we have right here that's a dug fir okay and then right here that's a big leaf maple so you got one dug fir taking up a quarter of what a or maybe an eighth of what a big leaf maple takes up when it comes to in the canopy. The other thing is the big leaf maple, they do a lot of shedding. So, and I'm not, listen, this is just what I've learned from living in this area for the last couple of years. They do a lot of shedding. And these branches, or these, yeah, these branches, whatever, the base is down here. These will break off and fall. And as they get bigger and then they fall, they take out your dug furs. Now, if you don't care what's in your woods, then leave them. But well, I'll show you what I do on this tree, and maybe I'll come back and do it at some point. But right, I usually try to do it in the late summer. Is if I was to do this tree, I would get as much of this tree to fall that way. Now, I have dug furs up here, right here. I have a bunch of smaller dug furs in here, and I have a few, well, not as many over there. So I'd get this tree to go that way as much as I possibly could. And it pushed, at first I would go in, I cut down a lot of the hawthorn and the, the hazelnut that's in here. There's a bunch of hazelnut in here. I would actually start falling all this stuff downhill as much as I could. And then I get this to fall on top of it. The goats literally in the fall, when I started chainsaw up, I, I, I almost have to like get distance from them because they will start coming and trying to eat the stuff as I'm dropping it. They really, really enjoy eating the leaves off the big leaf maples. Probably come in and clean up almost this whole area. And so this is one of those times when I would do something manually. And you know what, I'll video it when I do it so I can show you guys kind of what it ends up looking like. And the reason for doing that is the big leaf maple are not going to, they don't have any value to me timber wise. They actually only cause devastation. Um, and so for me, it doesn't really, it's not worth keeping unless they're already huge and then I'll keep them for milling, but they don't have much use for me other than that. And then the ha wild hazelnut, I actually like to cut that really short and I like, to, like it to come back every year. So it's almost like a crop to me for my goats. Here's another, this is a great example of a big leaf maple. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is technically one big leaf maple, but I mean, this is a great example. It, now this creates a lot of great shade. I'm not trying to get rid of all the shade. I want spotted shade, but this is eating up. I mean, look at the, this is one tree, okay? 
Look at the canopy size. I mean, this is eating up the space of, you know, 10 of these small firs. So, and this doesn't have, if you're looking at value, this doesn't have the value that a Doug fir has. So I have to then start to make a decision on what I'm gonna keep. The other thing is this grows really fast. So if I cut this back, and this has been cut back before. I know this because Herman used to come down with his goats and cut the east back. So um, if I come in and I cut chunks of this back and let it drop, it'll rot, which is great. So we have carbon sequestration. So we have the carbon, it lands on the ground. It's still underneath the shade. It breaks down over time. I mean, I can go through these woods and I'm stepping over, um, uh, you know, big leaf maple branches all the time because they're just these big leaf maples. They shed these branches out. And so if this let, was let to go, like for another 20 years, you'd only end up having like three main runs coming up. Um, but all right, so I'll show you kind of, I'll tell you what I would do with these because I don't want these to fall, the, these, these branches right here to fall this way. I would get them all falling down the valley, down this valley, ravine, this draw. I get them all falling this way. And then I'd fall those ones, some of them this way, and the rest that way on top of blackberry bramble and hazelnut. And, you know, here we got some bramble that's pretty big, but I got a, like, there's some pretty tall bramble right there. The goats can't get to that. You can tell because they've eaten all around it, but they can't get to the top. That big leaf maple up there, I'd drop that right over on those. Just a couple of the branches, not all of them, a couple of them. But you can see above that, I've left big leaf maple. So right there, there's a big leaf, there's a couple of sprouts coming up right there. I've left those. I left that oak. I'm not taking everything out, but part of the problem is there's no, um, we don't have fires anymore. We don't have fires coming through like we did a um, hundred years ago. You'd have fires that come through and it would clean out some of the under uh, some of this brush you know every so often and now we have housing everywhere we have farms we don't want fires we stop them you know we fight them um we clean up things we also don't have big deer and elk herds that would come through and just absolutely devastate you know certain plants and those plants would take a couple years to grow back before they would be full and abundant again so this is pretty bare. I was expecting a little bit more life to be on this hillside, um, to be honest. After I came through with the excavator in late winter. So I cleaned this up late winter. And I was expecting a little bit more vege vegetation. So what I'm going to probably do this coming winter, I'm going to feed hay. <clears throat> I'll feed hay on these areas and the hay has seed in it. What are you doing big guy? I'll scratch you if you want me to. Oh hey, hey Herman. Hey big guy, you are a sweet, you are a sweet goat, you know that. You're a sweet goat. He is, he really is a nice goat. And then we got, what are you doing? You relaxing there? The edge is cooling off. All right, I'll see you buddy. You have a good day. All right folks, I'm gonna go uh, work on finishing the road up. Not every day I take one of these <laughs> afternoon walks. Usually, usually it's an evening walk, but I figured since I was up here dealing with a few other things, I'd take care of the uh, checking on the goats. And uh, I'll probably put in some clips here of me doing the road. I know it's not the most entertaining stuff, but I want to show the progress. It's those, uh, those mile markers. At some point, you end up looking back and you realize how amazing your property looks. And it's great being able to document that. Not only for you, but for the folks around you. There's a vineyard right down here. And uh, we went over there for dinner one night. And we're talking about the old place. 
Larson is the gentleman who owned it. And uh, we're talking, chatting, and they pull out this big inch thick book. Had all these old photos of the Larsons. It has all the photos of what it looked like before they bought it and in the process of how they got it to where it is. And it's an organic vineyard. It's really, they've done a really nice job with it. And it's just, it's such a great example to show folks because it's oftentimes easy to go and buy a perfect property. That's the easy thing to do. But then you bought somebody else's work. And that's why you pay the price you pay for it. Or you can work the land yourself and enjoy that process and then know why you have what you have. If you buy something already done, you don't understand why you know the fences are the way they are or why they're not the way that you want them. Or you don't understand you know, why certain trees are in certain areas or why they've managed it a certain way because you didn't really have that learning experience. So I think it's really important if you really care about working your property. I think it's important to, 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 to get something that you can actually work that you'll learn while doing it. That being said, it's a lot of work. It really is. There are definitely days that I have to remind myself that this is not my job. This is a, uh, I don't want to call it a hobby because it's not a hobby. I, I take it very seriously. Uh, I think I don't feel like a hobby is something you take seriously. It's something you can walk away from if you want to. Um, it's, this is a lifestyle decision um, to, to work on our properties and develop them and learn while we're develop, developing them so that way we can pass that knowledge on to the next generation. It doesn't mean, and I've told all my kids this, they, they don't need to be, they don't need to work in the country, they don't need to work on a piece of land, but the idea of understanding how to manage something is very important. And you don't learn that, you don't learn those management skills until you have to plan out a year, two, three years ahead just to get to the point that you can do something simple. And sometimes that planning might be just buying an animal or it may be buying feed. I oftentimes buy a, my whole entire year's worth of feed for all my animals in the, in the fall because that's when everybody has a lot of it and nobody has come up short yet, generally. That's not always the case, but generally. So yeah, it's different for each thing, but you do have to schedule ahead. You do have to plan ahead. And I think that process of doing that and being around that as a kid, you don't, you, most kids don't pick that up. And so we're teaching that to our kids already. And like, I mean, for example, Clint's been waiting. <laughs> He's been waiting. He was waiting almost a year. I gave him that, I gave him that sow a year ago. He had been waiting a year to sell piglets. He finally sold his piglets. He got his pickup truck. You know, it's a lesson learned. I think it's important to pass on some of that management, those management skills to children. I think living in the country is a really unique way of doing it, as well as my kids get the adventure of a lifetime every day. So for me, I think living in the country is the way to go. I don't think you can beat it. Um, there isn't much that I think the city offers that I want. And I li I've lived in the cities. So I, in Philadelphia, I worked in New York. We lived in Baltimore, St. Louis. Um, I'll take the country any day. I'm gonna get down and make a pig wallet for the pigs. That's one of the reasons why I came up here. We have a tank up here. I wanted to turn the water on. Uh, I'm gonna chop off their, their water if they're not interested. I mean, that one's sitting in the sun over there. They're both sitting in the sun. Forget it, I give up. I was trying to keep them cool today. I'm done. I care too much about you guys. Come spill the water. I guess I had to do the pig thing and dump the water out.
There you guys go, there's dinner. They don't even care. These are really... These pigs are the most ingrateful pigs I've ever met. Not only did I bring water for them, fresh cool water, they don't care. I had to spill the water for them because they wouldn't spill it. And now I brought them dinner and they don't even care about dinner. That's it. I might as well go home and treat my kids good. Get the same treatment from them. Hey, oh, go enjoy dinner. Dear God, do I have to chase you over there to make you fat? I should say healthy, make you healthy. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to do anything to you. I just want you guys to eat good. Enjoy. Most ungrateful pigs I've ever owned. I don't understand this. I'm taking too good a care of these guys. All right, have a good one. Thank you for watching.